Okay, I think I'm live. I've never done a, a YouTube takeover before, so I'm guessing that everyone can hear me. Um, I think that the sound is working. Okay, cool. Um, so hi guys, my name is Lara. I am doing a takeover for Roxy today and I'm going to be talking to you all about the work that I've done with rhinos. Um, so first of all, we'll start off with introducing myself. So I'm 24 years old. I am a zoologist and a conservation biologist. Um, so I did a BSc in zoology at university and then I went on to do a master's in uh, wildlife conservation. And for that master's I was really lucky and I got to go all the way to Kenya and I studied black rhinos for three months. And it was just the most incredible experience I've ever had and it's just paved the way for where I want to go with my career and that is to work with rhinos and of course I had to share how amazing they are with all of you so yeah I'm gonna go through that and I did prepare a presentation but I've had a bit of trouble trying to get all the light working um I might see actually if you can see it I don't know let's take that out and maybe I can just show you does that come up the right way I'm not sure or is that all backwards but anyway, um, so first of all, what I want to start with is the fact that there are five rhino species in the world. Um, so we have two in Africa. We've got the white rhino, which is probably the most abundant. There's about 17 to 18,000 left in the world. Oh, Beth just says that's the right way around. Okay, perfect. Yay, I'll show it to you guys. <laughs> um, so you've got the white rhino. It's found in Africa, as I said, and its status is near threatened on the IUCN red list. Um, so this is the organization that gives us all the information about specific species and how many there are left in the wild. Um, we then have the black rhino, which is what I've studied in Africa, and there are only 5,500 of these left in the wild. And the main threat to all of these rhino species is poaching, really. Uh, they don't have any natural predators as a grown adult, except from us, which is really, really sad. And for black rhinos especially, between 1970 and 1995, they actually experienced a 96% decline in their total population in the world, which is just ridiculous. Um, so in 1995, there were only 2,500 left, and it's only thanks to conservation efforts that we're up to 5,500, which obviously still is not much at all. Um, so yeah, they're listed as critically endangered. We then have the greater one-horned rhino, which is found in India, Nepal, Pakistan, uh, Myanmar, and I think Northern Bangladesh. So there are approximately 2,200 of these left in the wild. And the main threats to these rhinos are poaching, hunting, and habitat loss. So again, poaching is coming up with all of them. And this is listed as vulnerable, but I think that listing is a little bit out of date. I think it said the last assessment was done in 2008. So it's possible that this has actually slid further down the scale to either endangered or critically endangered. Uh, you have the Sumatran rhino, which is found in Indonesia. Approximately 100 of these left in the world, but we're not entirely sure. And again, the main threat, poaching, hunting, habitat loss, illegal logging. Uh, what we're doing is we're really encroaching into areas that rhinos live in and they just can't cope with the changes. It's happening too quickly. Um, so it's just really massively affecting their populations. Again, listed as critically endangered. And then the Javan rhino, so also found in Indonesia, and unfortunately for this species, only 27 to 44 individuals left in the world, which is, is just heartbreaking, if you ask me. Um, so it's, it's unsure whether this species will even, even make it. Um, we just got to hope. So obviously there's a common theme there in that poaching or some kind of human influence is the main threat to every single rhino species on earth. So I feel like we have to quickly touch on this subject because obviously it's really, really important. Um, and basically 
rhinos are poached for their horns, which are used in traditional Chinese medicine. You know, some people believe that they can treat cancer and things like that. They are used as decorative ornaments in people's homes, and they are also used um, to, to carve the handles of ceremonial daggers in certain places. And now we have this situation where rhino horn is actually way more expensive than gold, and it can fetch up to 65 thousand US dollars on the black market per kilogram, which is ridiculous. Um, I just, I mean, that kind of money is just insane. So if anyone owns a rhino horn, or they can afford it for Chinese medicine, or they've got a dagger handle made of it, it's basically a status symbol in these cultures. Um, so it denotes your your wealth, and your your status in society. And the most heartbreaking thing about this is that rhino horn is made of keratin, which is a material that is also found in our nails and our hair. And there's absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that it contributes to any form of curing illnesses or cancer or anything like that. So it, it's really, really heartbreaking. Um, the thing with poaching is that it started off as a very low scale, you know, risk or threat to rhinos. So some poachers would just chop the uh, the fence of a reserve and they'd pop in and obviously find a rhino, take the horn and then get out. It's now developed into highly organised crime, which is fully funded by crime lords. It's, it's, it's a business. And, you know, in South Africa, there are poachers who have access to semi-automatic weapons. And if you're a ranger, you are now 19 times more likely to die than an FBI agent. So that is how big this scale is um, of the poaching crisis. And at the moment, especially in South Africa, where it's quite a bad situation, we're losing one rhino every 15 hours. So that equates to about 600 a year, which is just horrendous. And the problem is that they're quite slow breeders. So a female would not start to reproduce until she was about seven years old. Um, the gestation period or how long they have the baby in their tummy for is between 15 to 18 months, depending on what species you're looking at. And then that calf stays with the mum for maybe three or four years. So you've got a female who is probably not going to have a calf until that calf is until this calf has left. Um, so that's an interval of four point five to five years. Um, and what's happening is we're just losing them more quickly than they can reproduce. And although the poaching rate has slowed down the past couple of years, it's just there's so much work we have to do, and they still need so much help. So. We all really need to start raising awareness of what's going on uh, to our rhinos. Now, bearing in mind that we're talking about poaching, I just wanted to quickly touch on the fact that poachers get a really, really bad reputation, um, especially when there's an article that comes out in the news saying that poachers have been caught. They get a lot of hate in terms of media. And, you know, I can kind of understand it. They're, they're the people right at the forefront of everything. But I just want to touch on the fact that quite often the poachers are the most desperate and also the most vulnerable um, of this whole crime situation. They're the bottom link of that chain. And quite often, most of them live in poverty. Uh, they live on the outskirts of reserves. The thing is that most Africans have never seen a rhino because they reside inside these conservancies or these reserves. And this is now a privilege that is mainly restricted to Westerners who come in and they pay extortionate amounts to go on safari. So how on earth can you expect people from these local communities to forge any kind of emotional connection with a rhino if they've never seen one? They probably are unaware that there are so few left in the world. And if you are living in poverty and you've been struggling to feed your family properly for two to three months, um, you know, if someone came to offer you 80,000 rand, which is South African currency to, to kill a rhino. I, I, do, I don't think you can say what you would do unless you were in that situation. So yes, of course, poachers play a part, a massive part in this crisis, but we have to remember that they are not the driving force. The driving force comes from demand in Asian countries, but also these crime lords who are fully funding all these operations. Um, 
So just something to bear in mind and also something that people don't often think about. Um, now, when it comes to preventing poaching, there are several different things that people have tried. Uh, one of them being dehorning. So as you can see, this white rhino is having its horn removed. Uh, you would think that would work, right? Because uh, there's nothing for the poachers to get. There's nothing that they would want. But there is evidence that the poachers will just kill the dehorned rhino anyway, because they've come into the reserve, they've wasted time tracking that individual, and it doesn't have any value for them. So what quite often happens is that they kill the rhino that's been dehorned, because then it saves them time the next time they want to try and come in and take one. So that it's just such a tricky situation as multifaceted. Um, and there's so many issues that we need to address. The other thing is dye. Uh, they've tried to dye the inside of the rhino horn, so it has no value at all. Um, but again, it's just there's not really any evidence that this has worked. So some of the most effective methods that we have available to us at the moment is trying to increase community engagement, trying to get all the communities around these reserves involved actively in conservation. Maybe they have a job as a ranger. Um, we're trying to increase awareness and also education of of the children in the local areas and as I said most people have never seen a rhino there are lots of conservancies that will now bring school children in for a trip for free and let them go around the reserve so that they can see these animals for themselves and start to form some kind of connection but obviously these kind of things take quite a while so we've we've just got to keep up with our defense of the rhinos in the meantime um, keep on top of security and hope that by the time the younger generations start to come through, we, we've done enough that the rhinos are still around. Okay, but that's not what I was gonna to talk to you about today. So I was actually going to talk to you about my master's thesis um, and what I did when I was studying black rhinos in Kenya. Um, so just to give you a bit of, bit of background, uh, in response to human population growth, and the fact that we continue to encroach upon areas of wilderness, the designation of protected areas has now become a main global conservation strategy for the protection of vulnerable and declining species. And since 1970 alone, the extent of protected areas in Africa has increased to 3 million kilometers squared when all combined together. But obviously this is broken down into smaller, sometimes isolated reserves. Um, some species like the black rhino are almost entirely reliant upon these protected areas for their survival. Obviously, they've got such a high value placed on them that they, they mostly don't survive unless they've got protection of humans. The only thing with these protected areas is that they, they're often small and they're often fenced. And what happens is the animals cannot move into or out of the reserve. So if you have any food shortages on that reserve, uh, the animals can't go anywhere to, to supplement their food supply. So what happens is that these fenced areas can impose an artificial ecological carrying capacity upon the reserve. And what this basically means, it sounds really complicated, it's not. Um, <clears throat> it basically means that the number of individuals in a population that can be supported by the resources in a given area. So if I'm talking about my rhinos, it's the number of black rhinos in a particular area that can be supported by the vegetation or the resources in that area. So it's quite a simple uh, concept, but one that's really, really important in biology and ecology. So inside these fenced reserves, wildlife often lives um, in the absence of threatening processes. So you've got um, massive security teams to look after these rhinos. So hopefully poaching doesn't happen that often. Because of that, wildlife populations can often grow really quickly. Um, and if the number of individuals in that population exceeds what the environment can support, or exceeds that carrying capacity, uh, then we have something called overstocking that occurs. And if overstocking occurs, it can result in a number of negative impacts, such as really large scale vegetation changes across that landscape, um, even behavioral signs of stress. Um, so in rhinos that can exhibit itself as reduced breeding performance. And sorry, that arrow is supposed to be there. <laughs> um, and basically these negative effects 
contradict the goals of management. So when you've got a species like the black rhino, which is critically endangered, uh, the managers of reserves and also governments are trying to increase those numbers as quickly as possible. And if you've got negative effects as a result of overstocking, then you're actually looking at a reduced breeding performance and declines in population. So it's really important that we keep an eye on these populations, we keep an eye on the reserves and how they're doing, because if there are any negative impacts, we want to be able to rectify these as quickly as possible. Okay, so looking at my study species, uh, now within black rhinos, there are certain subspecies. Um, some of these are now extinct, unfortunately. So the Western black rhino is extinct. Um, I studied the Eastern black rhino. So uh, once again, this is a subspecies within black rhinos. So the first thing that you need to know is that black rhinos are browsers. So they don't eat grass. But what they do eat is woody vegetation, um, so lots of twigs and branches. They eat shrubs and they eat forbs. And they are also highly selective for plant species and height. So a bit like us, they have preferences for certain plant species that they like to eat. Um, and they also select certain species based on what height it is. They are mega herbivores, and this basically is a term that describes any herbivore over a thousand kilograms in weight and because they have such a large body they have to eat large amounts of food every single day just to meet their basic energetic requirements. So because of that rhinos are predominantly limited by resource availability or food availability. So it's not like an impala which may be influenced by the amount of food but also the number of predators in a reserve, uh, rhinos are only limited by the food resources available to them. Um, because of that, it's really, really important that we as scientists or reserve managers understand what resources are available to them and how they're using those resources. It's really, really important for us um, because we want to make sure those population growth rates continue to increase. Um, and Kenya is a stronghold for this subspecies of the black rhino. So Kenya has got a large population of the eastern black rhino. But globally, there are just 800 individuals left in the wild. So really not that many at all. So Kenya is on the eastern coast of Africa. Um, and I was based here in the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, so north central Kenya. It's just above Mount Kenya. Um, it's a really beautiful landscape. If anyone ever gets the opportunity to go, I really recommend it. It's just stunning. It's absolutely my favourite place in the world. Um, and obviously there's a ton of rhinos there. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little bit of background into why my study was needed, uh, Lewa Wildlife Conservancy has had a few problems with vegetation changes over the last 30 years or so. Um, and between 1987 to 2016, they lost a lot of their woodland and this converted into open grassland savanna ecosystems. And specifically, they had a 15% decline in the amount of woody vegetation and shrubs. Now, this is quite concerning because remember I told you black rhinos are a browsing species. They eat woody vegetation a lot. And some studies have even found that woody vegetation can constitute more than 63% of a black rhino diet. So if we're losing all of this woody vegetation and it's just turning into open grassland, then we're seeing massive declines in the amount of food resources available for those black rhino. Um, so because of that, it's really important for us to understand what this may mean and how this may affect their population in the future. And then just to give you like a bit of illustration, because I know that some people are more visual learners. Um, I know that it helps me to be able to look at a graph. Um, so this is the boundary of Labour Wildlife Conservancy. And what this map is called, um, it's a normalised difference of vegetation index. Basically, we use satellite imagery and the reflection of greenness to work out changes in vegetation density. I know that sounds like a mouthful. Um, and what it gives you is a scale. So you can see the, the colours here. You've got blue, which is minus 0 0.2 on this particular scale, and then red, which is plus 0 0.2. So down here, we've had an increase in the amount of vegetation on the reserve, which is to be expected because that area is a forest. 
But almost everywhere else, there has been a decline in the amount of trees and shrubs and woody vegetation. Um, so that's sort of the scale of the vegetation changes that we're looking at here. Now, to try and combat these vegetation changes and also to try and increase the number of food resources for black rhino, uh, Lewa established what we call exclusion zones. Um, so these are smaller fenced areas within the larger reserve. And you can you can imagine the fences, they look kind of like a, a badminton net. OK, so there's there's a pole and then you've got the fences uh, and these fences are between 1.7 to 2 metres in height. And they let rhinos and smaller herbivores pass underneath to access the vegetation within that protected area. But they stop elephant and giraffe. Um, and these these two animals also have to eat a lot of day. So they exhibit um, they put a lot of pressure on vegetation because they're constantly browsing. Um, the only thing with these exclusion zones is that no one ever look to see whether they actually worked. Did they increase the number of food resources for black rhino or not? So that was one of the main things that I was looking at with my study. So first of all, I wanted to see whether there was more food for the black rhinos inside exclusion zones when compared to outside. And basically to do that, I was looking at the difference in browse or it's basically just rhino food. Um, so each plot was given a percentage score and I'm not going to bore you by going into all the scientific detail um, but these were basically my plots I had a 16 meter diameter and I went up to two meters in height purely because black rhino can't reach above two meters and you have to imagine this is a 3d pie and if this entire space was completely full and dense, then it would be given a 100% score. Um, but if you put all of these trees together, it would probably only take up maybe 15% of that plot. So that was how I, I worked out how much food was available. And then I obviously wanted to work out exactly what the rhinos were eating. Uh, what species they were eating, whether they had preferences. And to do this, I followed in their footsteps um, for my entire study. So what I did was used a indirect method called backtracking. So this basically had absolutely no effect on the rhinos. Most of the time they did not know we were there. And what I did is I found some fresh tracks, some dung or a rhino, and I just followed along behind it and I identified what plants it had been eating on. And I know that sounds kind of weird, uh, but it's really, really easy to see what black rhinos have been eating because of the way that they sever plants. Uh, so because of their tooth morphology, they sever plants at a 45 degree angle. So you can literally walk along and you can see a plant that's got a cut like this. And you know straight away that a black rhino has had a little, a little nibble on it. Um, but this means that I could exclude all other herbivores from my data collection. Even if I had a bush that had been eaten by a black rhino and an impala and a giraffe, I could count the cuts which had been made by the black rhino. So that was perfect. Um, I terminated all of my following pathways after 30 meters because uh, usually the individual might have wandered off and stopped eating but quite often I actually came across the rhino whilst it was sleeping having a little nap in the day so um, obviously I ended the the transect then and one of the most amazing things about Lewa Wildlife Conservancy the reserve I was working is that they have this incredible monitoring situation for rhinos. They've got rangers on the ground every single day. And as soon as a rhino is sighted, the rangers report the individual and also the location of that rhino into the control room. So they all know how to identify them. And it just meant that I didn't sample a rhino twice, which is really important for my scientific study. So um, I don't know if you can see that, but this is me. Um, and this is one of my Maasai guides. He was amazing. There's a rhino here, but that wasn't the one we were tracking. So um, they really are everywhere in Leira. It's, it's such an amazing place. Uh, when I was following along behind them, I was looking at what plant species they were eating, uh, how many cuts there were on that particular plant. Um, so looking at the number of different twigs and branches that have been broken off and eaten. 
Um, the height class of plants. So remember that I said they were selective for height class. So I wanted to work out what they were eating in my study as well. Um, so height class A was any plant below 0 0.5 meters in height. Uh, B was 0 0.5 to 1, C 1 to 1.5, D 1.5 to 2. Um, and again, I excluded all vegetation above two meters just because black rhino can't reach it. Um, they can if they really want to, but it, it, it's a lot of effort for them to get that high. So most of the time, all they're feeding is below two meters. So where, when I was working out what the black rhinos were eating, I knew exactly what plants they were eating and how much of it they were eating. And I used this data to see whether they had preferences for a specific plant species. Like, did they like one species more than another? Um, and I did this by comparing the plants that the rhinos had eaten to the overall availability of that particular plant species across the reserve. Um, so obviously there was a lot of stats and different numbers and stuff that went into this, but that's the basic summary of what I did. And again, just remember that I also recorded the height class of the plants. So I've taken out most of the scientific content because I don't want to bore anyone. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, please do send me a message because I can send you my thesis. You can have a little read over. Um, obviously, this is only a, a tiny, tiny snapshot of what I did. Um, there's a lot more science behind it and a lot more methodology and things like that. But yeah, I'm just going to give you the main key results just so you understand what I found out. Um, so if we go back to those exclusion zones, those small protected areas of vegetation, um, on average, I found that the amount of browse available to black rhino inside the zones was 22% higher than outside. And remember I said that when people set these exclusion zones up, they had no idea if they actually worked. No one had ever done a study. So the best thing is we now know that they do work and we have a way to increase the number of food resources available for black rhino. And this is really, really important on reserves because as the population continues to increase, obviously, these individuals are gonna need more food. And when you're in a fenced reserve, you have to make sure that you can meet those requirements. Otherwise you have effects like overstocking occurring. So this is really important. We now know we've got a method to increase the number of food uh, resources available to Rhino and that can be used anywhere in the world. So this is amazing. Um, the only thing that we need to make sure with these zones is that they're constantly monitored or managed. Because quite often, if you've got an area of vegetation which isn't having any impact from browsing or there's no damage from other animals, the vegetation grows really quickly. And if it grows above two meters in height, it then becomes inaccessible to our black rhino who don't eat anything above two meters. So this is great, but we need to make sure that we're managing those zones. Um, and then when I was looking, when I was backtracking my rhinos and I was looking at exactly what they were eating, uh, first of all, to look at height, I found that 94% of all the plants consumed by black rhino were below 0 0.5 meters in height. And the reason that this is unusual is because all previous studies that I found in scientific journals on the internet reported that black rhino selected plants between 0.5 to 1.2 meters in height. So I found something completely unique here. And one of the questions that arose from this finding was are the black rhino specifically selecting lower growing plants because of all the vegetation changes that have happened on Lewa? Um, so this is something that we looked into a few months later. Um, and another reason for the, the fact that they selected low growing species was that it was the wet season when I was there the first time round. So there was an abundance of herbs and forbs that just shot up. And these are really, really succulent. They're really nice for the black rhino. They really like them. And they're only available during the wet season. Um, so the black rhino were eating all of these low growing herbs and forbs. And then when I did a bit more research, I found out that this is also a wet season adaptation shared by impala and waterbuck. Basically, because the plant variety, food abundance and nutrient quality is higher, the animals actually go to these plants in the wet season and it also helps them to avoid competition with other larger herbivores like elephants. So they're really trying to take advantage of these food resources whilst they're available. These plants are not available in the dry season. There's just not enough rain or moisture for them to grow. Um, so I, I found that really interesting. Hopefully you guys do as well. 
Um, and then looking at dietary diversity. So I just wanted to see whether what they were eating was uh, the equivalent to what was available. Um, and I found that the number of plants black rhino consumed was lower than what they could have had across the entire landscape. And what we put this down to was the fact that they were really selective about the, the plants that they were eating. So because it was the wet season and there was loads of plants available, there was lots of variety, they were basically being choosy about what they eat. So they do have preferences and they do select for certain plant species, which again is really interesting. Um, I then wanted to have a look at what food sources were really important for the rhinos. And the way that I did this was by using a selectivity index. So you, you might not be uh, familiar with this, but basically you put loads of values into a formula and it gives you a value between minus one and plus one. So minus one is complete avoidance of the plant. Uh, maybe they don't like it. Maybe it's got toxins in it or something like that. And plus one is complete selection. They really, really like this species. They're eating it disproportionately to what's available across the reserve. And I found that the species they liked the most was Acacia drapanolobium. Um, this is quite interesting because other previous studies have also found this to be a really important food source for black rhino. So obviously they quite like it. The reason that this is worrying is because on Lewa, this particular plant species has declined massively over the last 30 years. And originally people thought that this was due to elephant damage, elephant browsing, but also changes in rainfall patterns. Now, what I found was that 99.4% of those acacia drapanolobium plants that were eaten by black rhinos were below 0 0.5 meters in height. And basically the black rhino are eating the seedlings of this plant, which means that it can't establish itself, it can't regenerate, it can't create seeds to then increase the number of trees around. So the black rhino are actually contributing to the decline in the species, which again is really problematic, especially if it's favored. And interestingly, this is also a trend that's been found in other reserves like Old Pegeta, which is also in Kenya. And this might sound a bit familiar to some of you. It's where the last two northern white rhinos are kept. Um, Sudan was the last male and he died a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Um, but again, they found the same trend. I think it was 63% of their seedling mortality of Acacia drapanolobium was caused by browsing damage and drought. So it really enforces the need to protect this particular plant species for black rhinos. So why was my research important? Well, declining food sources on labor could basically impact the black rhino population and how it's performing. At the moment, it's growing, which is obviously amazing, but we're gonna get to the stage where these rhinos are at the ecological carrying capacity of that reserve. And we don't want that to happen. We wanna try and stop that from happening because we obviously want those populations to continue increasing. Um, so finding information like this out is, is power, basically knowledge is power. If we can understand how much food is available to those rhinos, um, how they use those resources, how the resources are changing, then we can do things like manipulate habitats. Um, we can enhance the growth of specific species like Acacia drapanolobium. Maybe we create a nursery which is protected from browsing pressure and we allow those seedlings to grow and then relocate them somewhere else in the reserve. Um, but we also have another important finding from this study, which is that exclusion zones work in increasing the amount of food available to black rhinos. So we can use these exclusion zones to set up new areas which are going to protect the, the trees and the woody vegetation um, and eventually lead to increases in, in food resources, which are going to continue to support black rhino population growth rates. Um, and that is the main aim, isn't it? For a critically endangered species, we're, we're wanting to, you know, increase those growth rates as quickly as possible. We, we want to stop them from, from going extinct, which is literally the main aim. Um, so looking more at the wider picture, well, the majority of the global black rhino population resides inside fenced areas or protected reserves. Um, and black rhino population growth rates are completely limited by food availability. 
So we want to ensure that enough food is available so that reproduction rates continue to increase. Um, or if we do get to a stage where that's starting to slow down, then we need to think about acting as a source population for other reserves. So what we can do is labor can start to translocate certain rhinos out of their reserve and into a new one to start up a new breeding population. They're not quite at that point yet. Uh, they have translocated some rhinos to a neighboring reserve called Barana, um, but it's just important to bear in mind that at some point we are gonna hit that ecological carrying capacity and we are gonna have to do something about it. But at the moment, we're just trying to extend um, the food resources and, and the things that support that population as, as long as possible. Um, things like translocation are really expensive. It's, it's a last resort. Um, we can now use exclusion zones to increase resources for black rhino. Uh, as far as I'm aware, Lewa Wildlife Conservancy is one of the only reserves in the world that use these exclusion zones. And we now have empirical evidence that they work. So we can start rolling this out globally uh, to other reserves that also have black rhinos who might be struggling with supporting their population. We've basically got a strategy which is going to enhance uh, the global conservation work for, for black rhinos, which it is just incredible. Um, and lastly, by making sure that our black rhino populations are growing, then we are contributing to the, the conservation of this critically endangered species. Um, so lots of people ask me, why rhinos? Uh, why are they your favourite species? And to be honest with you, if you had asked me that question before I worked with them, I would have told you that my favourite species was a leopard. But when you have spent seven months so I know I said um it was three I've actually been back to labor since and repeated the study in the dry season uh, we're currently just going through all the findings and all the results and once that's out I'll be able to share all that with you guys um but when you've worked with an animal which is so iconic and so prehistoric and just so unusual I think I mean, every time I see them, I, I get excited. I mean, I, I'm the same for a zebra, but there is something so special about rhinos. And so many people are completely unaware of the dangers that they're facing with poaching. People don't realize how big poaching is, the scale of it. Um, and also, I think they're a little bit harder to relate to than something like an elephant, which obviously displays quite humanistic emotions. Um, so when there are conservation communications or campaigns you know they really focus on elephant conservation because they can they can get an emotional reaction from us you know elephants do show empathy or certain human characteristics it's a little bit harder for us to try and get people interested in rhino conservation but having worked with them and having seen you know their difference in personality you know some of them are really bold and some of them just don't really care if you're there you know they might notice you and they're they're not fussed at all it's just I, I just feel like someone has to give them a voice and I'm really really passionate about conserving these incredible creatures and I will be absolutely devastated if we can't turn the tide on this poaching um so for me that that's why it's all all about the rhinos um there's so much more that I could talk about, but again, like I don't want to bore you guys. Um, if you are interested in hearing more, please do just drop me a message and I will do my absolute best to answer them. Again, if you want to hear more about the scientific detail, please drop me a message. I can send you my thesis or we can talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, and also, if you'd like to read up more about Lewa, please do. It is the most incredible reserve. The people that work there are so dedicated and they're so passionate about conservation um so if you've got any pennies that you can spare i know that times are a little bit tight right now but please head to their website which is www.lewa.org and there's a big button that says donate um but obviously give it a, a read and see see if you can find out more about the reserve and if you ever get an opportunity to go please do it's, it's just incredible um so yeah if you have any more questions just drop me a message. You can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Lara Wildlife. And again, if you want more sciencey stuff, more than happy to oblige. I just didn't know, didn't want to bore you guys. So yeah, thank you very much. And I hope you have a really good day.